On Friday, February 23rd, 2024, Rebecca Grossman, the wife of a prominent L.A. burn doctor, was found guilty of murder and other charges in the hit-and-run deaths of two young brothers in a crosswalk more than three years ago. She had been charged with two felony counts, each of murder and vehicular manslaughter, with gross negligence and one felony count of hit and run resulting in death. The deadly crash happened on the evening of September 29th, 2020, and rocked the small town community of Westlake Village, California, a city just on the western edge of Los Angeles County. Prosecutors had presented evidence that the data recorder in Grossman's white Mercedes showed that she was speeding up to 81 miles per hour just moments before the collision. And when she finally did tap her brakes, it only slowed her to 73 miles per hour, less than two seconds before a collision that set off her airbags. Now, I want to mention that today's video might contain some subject matter and analysis that some of you viewers might find disturbing. So please consider this your trigger warning. With that said, I'm Collier Landry. Let's get into it. Testimony continued today in the most notorious criminal trial. In when I was 12 years old, my testimony sent my father to prison for murdering my mother. I decided at an early age that our trauma should not be what defines us. It's what we choose to do with it that does. I'm here to share my unique perspective on true crime, mental health, society, and popular culture, albeit with a slight sense of humor. I'm Collier Landry, and welcome to my show. Mover Nation, wherever you may be and however you may be listening, thanks for making me a part of your day. I'm Collier Landry. This is a show where I give you my unique perspective on true crime, mental health, society, and popular culture, albeit with a slight sense of humor. Uh, now, today's subject matter, I, as I said, is a little heavy for those of you, but it's something that I remember really well because it happened during COVID. And honestly, as someone who uh, quit drinking alcohol a long time ago, when I see alcohol-related accidents, it really affects me. And I know a lot of people in Westlake Village because I obviously live in Los Angeles. Uh, it's a very nice neighborhood, uh, very nice area. Like I said, right on the outskirts of L.A., um, but it really rocked the community and rightfully so, because it was really tragic and again, really unfortunate what happened. So, uh, anyways, I want to welcome everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, as a reminder, if you are a member of the channel tonight is our inaugural edition of my, uh, Collier's AV club. We are going to screen tonight, my film, a murder in Mansfield. And if you have not seen the film and you are a channel member, this is your opportunity. So if you are a Patreon member or a channel member, you get access to that tonight. That will happen at five o'clock my time, 8 p.m. Eastern time. You can check it out. Uh, we will have comments and chat live on that. And I will sort of, depending on how it is, give some sort of play-by-play -play analysis of the film let you guys know uh, maybe some a little bit of the backstory. I might stop and pause it. It just depends on what the group wants. We will probably start that about 10 minutes after the hour, just so you guys know, uh, to allow people to kind of file in as they do at the theater. <laughs> um, we also might, um, I might share with you guys, and I've talked about it a little bit. For my members, I have a television pilot that I created, and I might share the sizzle reel with you guys as well. And if you are, again, a member of the channel, if you are a member of the Patreon, you will um you will be able to uh we will have our live members only meet and greet next weekend that will be saturday march 30th at noon so 12 p.m my time so that's 3 p.m eastern if you're on the east coast and hopefully that allows all of our fans from around the world to join big shout out to court mcneil for helping uh for helping moderate today and karen fan thank you guys so much welcome 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 everybody and i just want to take a moment to say hello um and again uh uh you know i realize this subject matter can be a little heavy for everyone and i just want to give that little trigger warning uh because it is um it can be heavy and I, I you know as i said i see this type of material and i get really really outraged <laughs> to say the least so um i hope that you guys are uh are 
all good with all of that. I'm just uh, adding some things to our uh, to our propose to our uh, episode today. But um, again, that is Maddie Soul with her little popcorn, and she is ready to go for tonight. So I uh, I'm excited that you guys can all. Uh, hopefully you all will be there and it'll be a great event. Um, this is our, again, our first time doing the AV club. We're going to every month do live screenings with members of films. I will probably start doing a murder in Mansfield monthly as well for people to check up. And uh, my co co-executive producer, John Morrissey, who I saw last night, he also did the film American history X. He is going to also uh, be able to join one of those lives as well. So you guys kind of hear uh, maybe, you know, we'll do a little Q&A afterwards and uh, we'll do a little banter and you guys can uh, see what it's like behind the filmmakers process because that is before this YouTube channel. That was my career for quite a long time. And I'm excited to share this, uh, this additional aspect of my of my life that you guys um, haven't gotten to see yet. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. So, um, okay. Now, if you are not familiar with Rebecca Grossman, she is a LA socialite. Her husband is a very famous um, uh, uh, burn surgeon. They, he has the Grossman Burn Center. And uh, or I, believe, I believe it is her husband, but they were estranged. She was having an affair with a former Dodgers baseball player <laughs> is where all that comes from. And that is who she was racing on that fateful evening of September 29th, 2020. Oh, I also want to give a couple shout outs to uh, um, a big shout out to Sarah Kelly, who rejoined the YouTube membership today. Uh, also, um, also Jen DeSemio, who rejoined at the $7 tier for the AV club on Patreon and on YouTube. Thank you guys so much for all, all of you guys that subscribe and pay the membership fees on both platforms. It helps create this show. It helps keep the lights on. And I'm so, so grateful. And it allows me to get new little toys like this, which is a uh, DJI Osmo Pocket 3, which I will be using to create content for y'all very soon. Uh, I'm very excited about this uh, as a gearhead <laughs> and as someone who... Uh, um, who is I was obviously a filmmaker. So having these toys and ability to create content for you guys, that's where it all goes. It doesn't go to buy fancy clothes or anything like that. It all goes to be able to create more content for you guys. So again, thank you so much. So Rebecca Grossman, as I said, she was found guilty on February the 23rd, 2024. Uh, so literally a month ago. And why are we bringing this up? Because she made headlines recently with some news about potential tampering. Uh, you know, w one of the things that, you know, this case took a long time to go to trial and a lot of the scuttlebutt, if you will, in the community around Los Angeles and in the areas was the fact that these were two young Latino boys that were, that were murdered. And also that um, she is very, very wealthy very active in the um, charitable uh, foundations community and things like that. And that's not to discount any work that she's done or anyone that has benefited from the Grossman Burn Center and the good work that they have done. However, that does not uh, exonerate her from her absolutely reprehensible behavior, which is essentially getting loaded, driving you know, almost three times the speed limit through a residential area and taking the lives of two young boys reprehensible behavior, gross, gross, gross. And then to add insult to injury there. And again, as I say on this program all the time, you know, I am not a lawyer. I am not a psychologist. I do not work in law enforcement. I'm just a guy who has been through a lot of shit. And when I see this happen, I, um, you know, she has ex exhibited behaviors that I, that ring very true to me, which I feel like my father is a malignant, narcissistic so uh, psychopath and sociopath and all of those wonderful personality disorders wrapped up into one and to see her lack of accountability lack of remorse um she she has gone as far as to say it was a conspiracy theory uh to to string along conspiracy theories saying that it was law enforcement that had it out for her i'm sorry that just doesn't happen you're rich <laughs> there is no conspiracy theory and everyone was actually afraid of the opposite that she was going to be able to pay off law enforcement and face a much lesser punishment now she has yet to be sentenced that is happening in april 
But right now she has been convicted and it does not look good for her. And rightfully so, to be honest with you. Uh, Marie Hathaway, thank you so much. Your Oscar, I have to resend your Oscar. We had some Oscar winners. Marie Hathaway took second place. Um, uh, 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 who took first place? Why, why, am I, why is my name? Why is her name escaping me? I'm so sorry. Um, oh man. Okay. I'm, I'm an idiot. We had an Oscar contest. A few people won. Marie Hathaway, <laughs> Marie Hathaway won as did, uh, as, and I don't know why I can't remember her, her name. She's a channel member. Oh my goodness. I'm embarrassed. Um, as I frantically scroll through the comments here, <laughs> Um, Cynthia Ann, thank you so much, Court McNeil. Cynthia Ann, who won uh first place and donated her t shirt to my little neighbor who dressed as Marisol for um <laughs> for Halloween. So, uh, anyways, Marie Hathaway, you're we gotta I gotta redo the thing on on Shopify so you can get your official mug for the show. Okay, that said, Rebecca Grossman playing victim which I think is the, probably the, the, the worst of all this situation is the fact that she is, has somehow decided and thinks that it is appropriate, which you would think that uh, someone who has been working actively in charitable foundations would know better than to play the victim, would know what it's like to really be a victim. I mean, a burn foundation does work with people who have, uh, who have, um, you know, suffered severe trauma and and physical injury, and uh, you would think that she would know better, but clearly she does not. Uh, Cat loves cat skills. Thank you so much for the super sticker. I greatly appreciate it. Again, all your support, everything. Uh, Cynthia Ann. <laughs> Everybody's commenting. Yes, it was Cynthia Ann. <laughs> Why her name escaped me? I feel like such a dunce. Um, but uh, okay. So Rebecca Grossman. Uh, this is, by the way, her Mercedes. So there are the two young boys. Uh, it, it's this whole thing is just is just terrible. Um, so uh, it was um, the the older boy's name was Mark Alexander and his younger brother Jacob, and they were rollerblading in a crosswalk. And I can and again I can remember when this happened because. I was working with a client on set and she said, did you hear what happened? Cause she was from Westlake village. And she's like, did you hear about this? And I said, no. And she's like, yeah, this woman just literally barreled through an intersection without looking, without stopping and just wantonly uh, took the lives of these two young boys, like right in front of them. I mean, the whole family, it's so, it, it's very, very tragic. Um, so uh, again, Prosecutors had presented evidence that the data recorder in Grossman's white Mercedes showed that she was speeding up to 81 miles per hour just moments before the collision. And when she finally did tap her brakes, it only slowed her to 73 miles per hour, less than two seconds before the collision had set off your airbags. And also because of the collision, her Mercedes uh, had stopped a few, you know, a couple hundred yards away. One of the boys flew uh so one of the boys had flown more than 250 feet away from her vehicle when struck that's how fast and how much force this young man was hit with and uh, and uh, obviously they went instantly and that's a, a, a good thing uh you know almost instantaneously thank god there was no suffering involved however um for the for the older boy but the younger boy jacob did die a few hours later after he was taken to the hospital so at her boyfriend at the time was a former Los Angeles Dodgers pitcher. His name was Scott Erickson. And he was just in front of her when she fatally struck 11-year-old Mark and his younger brother, Jacob, in the crosswalk. Initially, Erickson was charged with a misdemeanor, of, uh, misdemeanor count of reckless driving, but it was dismissed after he made a public service announcement. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't know what that was. Is that a public PSA saying don't drive drunk and, and uh, street race with your rich girlfriend. I don't know. Um, Grossman's lead defense attorney originally. So um, Rebecca Grossman's defense attorney originally uh, and repeatedly tried to blame Erickson for the deaths of the, of the kid, of the children uh, suggesting that the baseball player's car 
hit Jacob first, hurling him to a curb and then hit Mark, which threw him into the path of the Mercedes. The boy's mother, Nancy, testified that the black SUV driven by Erickson did not hit her sons, but could have hit her and her five-year-old son, Zachary, if she hadn't dove out of the way and pulled him to safely. She did not see her other sons being struck, but eyewitnesses testified that they saw a white or light colored vehicle hit the boys, which was the color of Rebecca's Mercedes that she was driving. Rebecca's husband, Dr. Peter Grossman, said that he and his wife were separated at the time, quote, living separate lives under the same roof while dating other people. Uh, and there is Rebecca's husband and her way to court. And there is her, her um, former Major League Baseball star uh, boyfriend. And there is her disheveled Mercedes that she had uh, obviously claimed didn't, I didn't hit anything. Very, uh, and, and I'll get into this a little bit later, but her blood alcohol level, which was around the legal limit uh, in California, but she had also taken Valium as well. Welcome, Legally Red. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome, welcome, by the way. Uh, well, where is our, uh, where is our, where is Tatina at? Tina is not here. Oh, well, um, then we cannot start the party. Um, thank you, Sarah Holman for also turning in. Welcome Debbie Blair, obviously welcome, uh, Marie Hathaway and KWAX 1978. Yes, it is heartbreaking prayers for the family indeed. Um, so, okay. So the, um, so again, her defense trying to trying to pin everything on uh, Scott Erickson, and uh, as Rebecca's husband Peter Grossman had said, he and his wife were separated at the time, quote, living separate lives under the same roof while dating other people, and he knew that she was dating Erickson. Now, uh, he also testified that he had ridden in a vehicle with Rebecca hundreds of times and he had no recollection of her ever speeding despite his st his statement prosecutors pointed out rebecca's multiple st speeding tickets in the years leading up to the incident as evidence in her trial so again again um and not to make light of this because two young boys lost their lives a family has been lives have been forever shattered because of this wanton just complete uh display of just callousness and just i don't care devil may care i'm rich and i can do whatever i want type of uh entitled behavior that um i would say that both her and scott erickson had um engaged in because they were you know i think about it a lot and i remember when i was a kid i got my first speeding ticket when i was i think 17 years old uh i was driving in a uh was I driving into school? So everybody out in front of my high school, uh, it was 25 miles an hour. And it was like a rite of passage where you would get a speeding ticket. And I was not driving 75 miles an hour. I think I was driving like 29 miles an hour. So like five or maybe eight miles an hour with the speed limit. It, it was not very much at all. But I got pulled over by the police and got my speeding ticket. It was sort of like everybody got busted for this. Uh, when you were a young driver, but I remember going to court and the judge, there was other kids that had driven like, you know, 60 miles an hour in a residential neighborhood, like all this. And I remember the judge breaking down the amount of time. This is something I still think about when I drive. And uh, to anyone who has ever ridden with me or dated me, you know that I am a very safe driver. <laughs> I drive the speed limit or slightly over on the freeway. I do not speed, uh, partially because. I, for a long time, rode a motorcycle, and I always tell people, you should learn how to ride a motorcycle and ride on the street because it will make you a much better driver, even though it's very dangerous. Uh, it makes you a much better driver because you become so much more aware of your surroundings and people on you know, these devices all the time, not paying attention. You become hyper aware of your surroundings, so uh, and then therefore you are a better driver. I would say that once I started riding a motorcycle, I became a much better driver. However, uh, I remember being in this particular courtroom and the judge said, was giving an example of the amount of time that you saved speeding versus traveling the speed limit. And it was something like he broke it down. It was, it was in 10 minutes from to get home 
you know, three, four miles away. You know, I lived in the country, so it was, you know, the middle of nowhere. Um, and uh, or at least compared to Los Angeles, the middle of nowhere, I should say. Um, and I remember it was something like you saved like 15 seconds. And I remember thinking, okay. And just right here, I live here in Santa Monica and I was at a crosswalk on my bike uh, the other day and there was the crossing guard crossing with the children going to school. And one set of children had cleared the path and this woman in the intersection with the crossing guard in the intersection started to speed to try to drive through the intersection. Another car had come and started honking its horns and stopped her because there were two more kids coming the other side. Again, I don't understand it. I don't understand why everybody's in such a big fucking hurry, but this is what you get. So again, I almost witnessed two kids get flattened by someone in the middle of the day that was probably sober, just, oh, I got to get to where I am. I think about this a lot when I drive because people's sense of entitlement sometimes is just too much. And I think a lot of this ex was as exacerbated by the by the pandemic for sure because um i remember even that's why i stopped riding my motorcycle everywhere because people became maniacs during the pandemic and i was actually terrified of riding the, <laughs> the bike because some people i just you know devil may care attitude we don't care uh we're gonna go where we want to go and um to hell with you so um again rebecca grossman enough pontification uh enough enough pontification for me on this subject um, Rebecca Grossman. So, uh, you know, multiple speeding tickets that she got, uh, multiple speeding tickets. And along with the many things that the defense tried in order to stall the case, they repeatedly attempted to pin, uh, the blame on Erickson during the trial, even going so far as to have Grossman's daughter, Alexis testify on the witness stand, the 19 year old who was 16 at the time said that she or said she ordered pizzas at around 715 which was about 5 minutes after the crash and later went out to meet the delivery person who had been delayed due to a resulting road closure when she was driving back <laughs> I thought the roads were closed uh uh, she saw her mother detained by the police near the SUV and tried to run over to her, but was stopped by the police. That's when she spotted Erickson, quote, behind a tree, but in the bushes, poking his head out, looking at what was going on. We made eye contact. She said this under oath. She said that she then went home and had only been and had only been there a short time, a short amount of time when Erickson burst through the front door frantic and red face and smelling of alcohol and asked, why did your mom stop? Why did your mom stop? Now, to be clear, Rebecca had said <laughs> that she had intended to drive away from the scene, but could not because her car stopped on its own. She even said that in the hospital and when she was being treated for her wounds, that, um, that she was, um, that she would have been home if her car and, and, and comfortably sitting in her lounging clothes if she had not have been stopped because the Mercedes stopped because of the impact. And obviously, again, when you have a fancy new car, <laughs> a very expensive automobile that obviously links up with stuff like this. I mean, we all see the Apple ads with the crash, with the crashing and, and the, the crash alert and everything. Uh, obviously, it can connect and it can tell you're in an accident and it does automatically stop the car. So the fact that people, again, Technology, guys, it really helps a lot of us. But also when you are a stupid criminal, you know, never, as I like to say, never underestimate the predictability of stupidity. When you're a dumb criminal, somebody who's committing a wanton and selfish, callous act, uh, you will get busted by technology. It is not your friend. It can be your worst enemy. And obviously her car stopped and uh, she is therefore held accountable because she, as she said, I was intending to drive home. She didn't care. When she was cross-examined, Ryan Gould asked her if she, if she thought to point out the six foot four pound, to, the six foot four, two hundred pound man hiding in the bushes to the officer at the scene, and she said, "quote No, and I wish I did because if I had, I don't know, maybe we wouldn't be here right now." 
Gould reminded Alexis that during the preliminary hearing in, in April of 2022 and in many of the pretrial conferences, some of which she had attended, there was no record of her providing this information until December 19th, 2022, when she spoke to her mother's attorneys. And that even after that, prosecutors only received the statement in January 28th, on January 28th, 2023. Alexis said she confided in her mother's, her mother's first attorney, Richard Hutton, who told her that authorities had charged the wrong person and not to get involved. Interestingly, Mr. Hutton became ill and passed away last year and isn't, isn't here to either confirm or deny the story. Defense attorneys, uh, uh, Gould then asked when he interviewed her back in July of 2021, when he asked her if she had, uh, whether she had seen Erickson, uh, whether she had seen Erickson make it back to the house that night, or if their paths across at all, she said, no, Alexis said, quote, I was scared of him. He told me if anyone he would, if I told anyone he would ruin me and my family. <sighs> Anyways, uh, it could have been her alcohol and Valium filled mother that maybe perhaps ruined the life of her family, but that's another subject coming up a little bit later. So Defense also tried to paint the investigation as, quote, horrible, performed by the C team and, quote, rife with errors, the least of which was fa was failing to identify the car driven by Erickson and failing to examine it. While the prosecution acknowledged mistakes had been made, but, quote, in the end, we know based on the evidence that we got it right. Uh, Thursday, on Thursday, February 22nd, 2024, prosecutors accused Grossman of leaking confidential information about her case to a TV reporter and trying to influence the jury that was in deliberation and asked for her bail to be revoked. Deputy District Attorney Ryan Gold told the judge on that Thursday that the wealthy socialite had asked for the card, the card of a Fox News journalist at her trial. Soon afterward, the network aired a story saying it had received emailed material, including two videos, which alleged that information which could prove her innocence had been kept away from the jury. Quote, this was a direct violation of a protective order the judge had made to exclude certain evidence from the trial, said Gould, adding that it was, quote, a deliberate attempt to influence the jury. Now, to be honest with you, exactly what it sounds like of course the defense told the court that they knew nothing about the leak and added that uh and added that just because a reporter had received an email that quote didn't mean it came from miss grossman mrs grossman and he pointed out that the jury had been warned at the beginning of the trial not to read or watch any news the judge did not revoke bail, but did say he would investigate the episode and warn Grossman, quote, I don't want to hear of anything close to this again. You don't want to end up being remanded. So obviously she was out on bail and he was going to remand her into custody for the rest of her trial. But the entitled socialite didn't seem to heed the warning as she stood up and blurted out in the courtroom, quote, can I put on the record? before her attorneys quieted her and her husband yelled out, Rebecca, to stop any more outbursts. Again, this type of behavior, in my opinion, again, not a lawyer, not a psychologist. <laughs> I don't work in law enforcement. I'm just a guy that's been through a lot of shit. I promise the t-shirt's coming. Uh, I... Uh, this reminds me of my like my father's entitled behavior on his in his trial as well. Um, not because he made any outbursts or anything like that, but because he thought he was smarter than everyone else in the room, including his own attorneys who advised him against testifying on his behalf, which, uh, was ultimately one of his major downfalls. Well, that and killing my mother was probably the biggest downfall, uh, <laughs> and having me as a witness, um, on February 23rd, after hearing the verdict, Grossman, who had been out on $2 million bond for the last three years was led out of the courtroom in handcuffs. Her lawyers asked the judge to allow her to remain free on bail pending her sentencing in April, but Superior Court Judge Joseph 
Brandolino denied the motion saying, quote, she has been convicted of a very, a very serious crimes. It's been over three years. So I think justice can no longer be delayed in the case. By the way, kudos to that judge uh, for holding her accountable and taking her, remanding her into custody at that point, because honestly, uh, she may have fled. <laughs> she may have found a way to flee. And uh, also she, um, you know, uh, again, this whole time, she seems to think that she is above the law, which is, I, I, it never, it never ceases to amaze me how, and this is why I, I draw a lot of comparisons, as I said, from the top of the show, uh, to my father's behavior in a lot of ways is this like wanton, just narcissistic uh, behavior and just thinking that you are literally smarter than everyone and anyone. And by the way, you're entitled to do whatever the hell you want because it doesn't matter what anybody else's feelings are or families or children or anyone that gets in your way of you having fun and partying. If your Mercedes hadn't automatically stopped, you would have just kept on going. It's just all just so bad. Um, the sentencing for Rebecca is scheduled for April the 10th, 2024. So in what is that two weeks? And I'll keep you updated when that comes, um, when that comes due, uh, she can face up to 34 years in prison. Um, again, uh, as I said, I remember when this case happened, I remember talking to people who lived in Westlake village who brought it up on set. Um, how bad it was in fact yeah it was my sound guy on a project and he was and he lived in that area and was moving to ventura later on and he was like i cannot believe this just happened um you know he also had you know three young girls and uh it, so it really affects it really affects parents um i'm not a parent but i am a dog dad and if someone drove through the intersection and hit Marisol, I'd probably lose my mind. Uh, it took the jury, which consisted of nine men and three women, about two days to reach the verdict with about nine hours of that spent on reviewing evidence. Nancy Iskander, the, the boy's mother, said that, quote, the trial wasn't easy, but it will bring me closure. Uh, it will bring me closure. There, sorry, trying to show uh, the young boys. Um, it, uh, the trial wasn't easy, but it will bring me closure. She also had nothing but praise for the prosecutors saying they worked tirelessly for tirelessly for three and a half years. They went above and beyond. They only cared about the truth. They wanted to tell the truth and they worked against some of the most evil defense attorneys. Quote, we're trusting the justice system. She said, we have a justice system you can trust from our experience uh, for, uh, we, we have a justice system that you can trust from our experience. It's not a justice system where people get away with things based on the color of their skin or their wealth or anything. If you commit a crime, you will be held accountable. So we are very thankful. And now it's time to do good in the name of Mark and Jacob. I mean, that's very beautifully said. Um, the boy's father added, we have been waiting for Miss Grossman to apologize, to take responsibility, and she just chose to fight to the end, and it was heartbreaking, he said. It allows me to just move on and heal and not allow any hatred or any loss of peace to affect how I feel, he added. I hope everyone heals, everyone learns from this experience, including everyone involved from all sides, and hopefully this saves lives, saves other kids in the future. You know, that's a really beautiful thing to say that he's that he hopes that this serves as a cautionary tale for um, other people, other families that may be dealing with this, but also to save lives and the names of his two young boys who he lost. Um, that takes a lot, it takes a lot of courage to say that publicly, it takes a lot of um, of chutzpah and um and grace to allow that and to um, entertain forgiveness. And I also understand because they wanted an apology and she never apologized. In fact, she said the opposite. She was entitled. And that I think is the, the biggest insult to injury in these types of situations is that they, is that these criminals, because she's a criminal, she is a convicted murderer of two young boys uh, and she's facing 34 years in prison. Uh, rightfully so. I hope she gets every bit of that time. Um, you know, and, and she's turned and again, you think about it and, uh, you know, I'm somebody who, uh, I quit drinking alcohol on November 5th, 2020. I have been behind the wheel of an automobile and not been, 
not been of the, I should not have been in behind the wheel of an automobile at times for sure. We, I think a lot of people who have, who have consumed alcohol, it takes very little to make you impaired. And, um, you know, I think it, if people can look at this and go, yeah, I'm going to take an Uber, especially nowadays, you know, 10, 15 years ago, it might be a little hard to get a taxi. Now you can get an Uber and there's no such thing. A lot of bars actually pay for that now. I think it's something to keep in mind, to bear in mind. Uh, don't let this be you because um, you can alter this. And I, I it can alter your life in the split second. I remember my father, uh, his cellmate was in, uh, obviously incarcerated. He had he had he was convicted of manslaughter. He also came from a very wealthy and prominent uh, political family in Avon Lake, Ohio, which is a suburb of Cleveland. And um, he he went to prison, did 11 years for killing someone, um, uh, uh, driving a vehicle intoxicated. We had a channel member here uh, several months ago who was part of our little community, Mover Nation, who lost her life because of a drunk driver the, towards the end of last year. Again, really you know tough stuff. But again, all very 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 preventable. Um, don't get behind the wheel if you're impaired. Don't you know? Period one drink just it's not worth it because you get pulled over and you god forbid something happens somebody runs out in the street and you don't mean to hit them if you have any alcohol in your system you're gonna go to jail like it's gonna alter your life forever even if you were quote sober it's just a bad idea all the way around and again this is a cautionary tale so it's great to hear the father sort of look at it this way now why are we talking about all of this right now well on friday march 22nd um, there again, when we talk about this entitlement and privilege of this woman, it seems to be moving forward with full force, despite her actually being incarcerated. Um, perhaps she didn't realize, or perhaps that she didn't care <laughs> that all jailhouse calls were recorded when she was captured, ordering her family to release evidence that had previously been sealed during her trial as well as to track down witnesses to get them to admit their testimony had been directed. Again, um, this is something that my father would write to me uh, about many times and try to, to say that I was coached, um, uh, that I did not hear him murder my mother, that I made everything up, that the police had planted all that in my head, which was absolute, absolute utterly fanciful, complete, utter rubbish. Uh, because I'm the one that, told, that alerted the authorities in the first place by way of my mother's friends. Um, Jen Semio, by the way, thank you so much for your 10 months of membership. Thank you also for uh, signing up for the Patreon. And I saw Court McNeil, or sorry, uh, I saw Tina Luffman is here so the party can get started. Also, thank you so much, Gen X Granny. I was thanking all of our wonderful moderators earlier. So thank you, Gen X Granny, for coming Um for coming on. Uh, yes, so many lives do get wrecked from drunk driving and drunk decisions. I was, um, I was so, uh, ironically, I had a, uh, uh, a woman reach out to me on TikTok. I went on TikTok. I, for those of you that don't know, if you follow me on TikTok, I have like a 300,000, I wish I had 300,000 subs over here, 300,000 over there on TikTok. And, um, I was, uh, going through, uh, messages and I saw somebody message me and her son is incarcerated in the same prison where my father is incarcerated, which is Marion Correctional Institution. And um, he was he's incarcerated. He's going to be getting out soon, but he was incarcerated because he got into a domestic violence situation uh, and he was intoxicated. And again, I was already in her, I, you know, I felt bad. He served his time. He served, his, he, he realized he served his time. He's apologized. He's tried to make amends. He's done all the things to reform himself, realizing that that was a bad way to go. But it, there are so many lives that are destroyed by alcohol. Uh, it is absolutely wild to me. Um, and uh, it, this, it, you know, obviously now his family is very impacted by it. Then um, uh, Rebecca Grossman's family is impacted by it. And the Is Iskander family has clearly been impacted and the community as a whole in, uh, in Westlake village, California. So again, a lot of this, and it's all so preventable. <laughs> it's all so preventable. This isn't an unfortunate accident in terms of the person driving the vehicle made a mistake or took a wrong turn or didn't see, just was blindsided. They were intoxicated. And she also admitted to taking Valium 
so yeah, not a good situation and, and speeding recklessly, recklessly. Um, so again, back to Rebecca Grossman, she had directed, uh, tried to say that these witnesses were coerced by leaking this to the media and coming after these people, a conversation that uh, Grossman had with her daughter, Alexis included instructions for the young woman to make a make public, a deputy worn body camera that had been sealed by the judge during trial. I want you to quote, unblock these videos. Grossman tells her daughter in a, in a call on February 23rd, 20, uh, 2024, mere hours before the verdict had been reached, reached Alexis Grossman replied, I will. Dr. Peter Grossman, uh, Rebecca Grossman's husband, then interjects, everything you want us to put out, honey, let us know. We're going to put it all out. To which Grossman replies, I want you to put everything out. In another call last month, Grossman suggested that witnesses should be tracked down and made to say their testimony was directed. Quote, if we can get witnesses to come forward and say they were told to say things, this can get us a new trial. Her daughter replied, I'm going to do everything for you, mom, everything. And so is dad. Prosecutors filed a motion on Friday, or I'm sorry, on Thursday. No, Friday, March 20, 22nd, 2024, that alleged a juror had come forward to complain that despite jury members being told that their identities were protected, a private investigator working for Grossman had attempted to question him outside his home about how the jury reached its verdict. Juror number seven sent an email to D District Attorney Ryan Gould stating that a private investigator came to his home on March 11th, 2024. Quote, he came to my house looking for me personally, the juror wrote. He introduced himself, gave me his card and told me uh, and, and told me out front that I didn't have to talk to him if I didn't want to. And then asked if he could talk to me about the Grossman trial. I asked him why. And he told me he was working for the Grossman family and wanted to know more about what in the trial influenced the jury in their decision. I told him we won't talk to him. And he left. Now. Just to as a side note, again, not a law enforcement, not a lawyer, not a psychologist. It's a guy who's been through a lot of shit. I have a lot of friends who are former detectives in both LAPD and in federal the federal government that are now private investigators. I know a lot of you are probably like, why, why can a private investigator do that? Because private, private investigators have a lot more leeway for their clients and to get information than law enforcement because they are not bound by the law and they are not bound by the code and ethics that comes with carrying a badge. So they can sort of do things that might seem sly and underhanded, but it's a way of pursuing an investigation because a lot of times when they're trying to do something for good or they're trying to help somebody like find a family member, they're able to use unconventional means to get information for that family, especially in missing persons cases. But so before we bag on the on the private detective, he's just doing his job. He was hired by somebody to do a job. It is what it is. It's just like the lawyers and lawyers appear to be slight. Look, I, lawyers are bottom feeders. <laughs> My experience with a lot of them are there's only there's a few good ones. There's a few good ones. Matt Finkelberg, if you're out there, you are a fantastic one. Um, but for the most part, yeah, but they're doing their jobs and they're working for their client. And they're trying to do the best they can for their client. Uh, it's just, Depends on who they decide to represent. Uh, it, you know, it's a little bit, a little much. I'm glad I'm not a lawyer. So anyways, back to the story. John Hobson, another one of Grossman's new attorneys, told the judge on Friday, March the 23rd, 2024, or March 22nd, 2024, that she did not understand the seal on the evidence was still in place after the trial had ended when she directed her daughter to put up the video. The prosecution inserted that the investigator identified as Paul Stuckey could only have located the jurors if he had access to their private information, which was sealed by the judge, which is standard procedure in California. They further explained that in this case, the defense had not requested the court to disclose the jurors identity, which can only be done if there is a compelling reason. Quote, it is clear that the jurors in this case believe that their information would remain private and that they would not be contacted without having been given notice. The prosecution wrote in its latest filing. The prosecutors asked the court for all such information to be returned and the judge ordered the defense team to destroy any juror names or other information obtained during trial and not to contact jury members further. 
The judge said that while while he did not view the efforts to speak uh, with the jurors as tampering or harassment, he did believe that it was a technical violation of the rules that protect jurors' identities. He, and he warned uh, uh, Grossman's team that if they perceived uh, that if the court perceived that Grossman or her attorneys were tampering with witnesses in the future, he would restrict her jail contact privileges. As far as her previously captured re uh, recorded phone calls, Joseph Brandolino refused to move Grossman to a part of the jail system where her mail is checked and she would uh, and she would have no access to phones or visitors except for her attorneys saying the punishment wasn't necessary. Quote, I don't see this as witness tampering. This is someone who believes she was railroaded, Brandolino said during a hearing. She is upset and she is, quote, naive. He did warn the defense team again, though, that going forward, any release of evidence under seal would result in financial sanctions for them, and he would report them to the state bar. So now her attorneys will get the message of like, we don't want to screw up our lives either over this woman. <laughs> we don't want to do her dirty business, her dirty work uh, as well. Um, and B Moore says, hi, Collier just popped in. Don't know if you mentioned, if you mentioned, but her ex Grossman's burn center is where Anne Hache was taken after her horrible, uh, accident and subsequently passed away, which was literally right down the street here, um, from where I live. And yes, Anne Hache was also who suffered, um, who had massive substance abuse problems, um, and suffered quite a bit from my understanding. And she has a son and, or a child and, and they've talked about it. It's, uh, I mean, I feel very bad for her. She also rammed into someone's house, but thank God the animals, the, the woman who lived there, everything, uh, no one was injured or, or hurt other than Anne Hayes. I mean, obviously it was massive, you know, financial damage and damage to the house and the property and all of that, but everyone was safe except for Anne Hayes, who lost her life, who struggled for many, many years with addictions of all sorts, uh, from, uh, hard drugs to alcohol and, uh, very, a very sad story. <clears throat> Indeed, no one's lives were taken. I would not put her in the same, in the same, uh, class as Rebecca Grossman. That's for sure. Um, but also not a great, not a great situation. Uh, but it is, it is, it's a problem. And I think, for, you know, on that note, since you mentioned that, uh, I do think, uh, again, as someone who's a sober person, um, you know, I think that, um, I, I think if there was some contrition shown by Rebecca Grossman, things might be a little different for her. I think it's the fact that she fought this tooth and nail and literally blames everyone else but herself <laughs> for her actions. <laughs> That's, um, that, that, that sense of entitlement that sort of uh, what I believe to be a narcissistic uh, behavior. Um, again, it's everyone else's fault, but their own. They can never be held accountable for everything. It's a common theme of this. My father is the same way. Always someone else's fault. In fact, for those of you getting to watch Murder in Mansfield in about one hour and 10 minutes from now, you'll get to see that live uh, and in person. You'll get to see uh, my father blame people. <laughs> And write to me and even gaslight his own son. Uh, it's wonderful, <laughs> riveting entertainment. Obviously, I'm being a little cheeky, but of course, it's my story, so I'm allowed to do that. Um, again, this behavior with her. And, and as he said, she is upset. She is naive. She believes she was railroaded, et cetera, et cetera. This judge is very lenient, but also, you know, now putting the hammer down with the, with the defense attorney is like, hey, man, like, let's cut this shit out. However, Deputy District Attorney Jamie Castro, or maybe Jaime Castro, uh, no, Jamie Castro took exception to the judge's view, saying the calls were not the words of a naive woman, but one who was trying to influence witnesses and blatantly violate a court order. She has ten. She has had ten attorneys by my count and spent four years in the court system. The prosecutor said, "Quote: She knows better. To characterize it as naivete isn't good enough." I would kind of concur with that. And indeed, she does have a new legal team led by Samuel Josephs, an appellate lawyer who focuses on white collar criminal matters. Also on the team are John Hobson and James Spurtis. They successfully petitioned the judge to delay her sentencing, which had been scheduled for April 10th, 2024. 
Joseph is asking the court that Grossman's sentencing be, be moved to June 10th, saying his partner, James Spurtis, would, uh, would be handling a motion for a new trial and needed time to review the voluminous court record. Despite objections from the prosecution, Judge Brandolino said that given the numerous trial motions, such a delay was reasonable. According to a video analysis by, oh, our good friend, Dr. Tagrande, Rebecca has accumulated four speeding tickets in the last 20 years preceding the, coll the collision with one particular incident of note occurring after being pulled over on the, on the 101 freeway after driving 92 miles per hour. The officer who pulled her over told her that she could kill or injure someone by driving at that speed, and she in turn told the police that he had better hope he never needed to go to the Grossman Burn Center. Again, showing this massive sense of entitlement and what I believe to be narcissistic behavior, but I'm not, this is not, this is only my opinion. I am not giving any sort of diagnosis because I'm not qualified to do so. But in my opinion, having dealt with a father who is a malignant, narcissistic psychopath who murdered my mother, this is very similar behavior to me. Threats, trying to coerce people, trying to get people to change their stories, gaslighting them that they didn't do this, and doing whatever corrupt means you can get your hands on. Uh, it's it's pretty bad. It's pretty reprehensible. She seems to be a very reprehensible person for sure. And the fact that her family stands by, behind her is a very puzzling sort of circumstance uh, because I don't think this is going to end well for her. Uh, I, you know, she is locked up and she did take the lives of two human beings. And if you believe in things after this world exists, well, you got one person to answer to, and I wouldn't want to answer for these types of situations. That's for sure. This exchange uh, of her, of her and the police officer, uh, perfectly illustrates the arrogance and grandiosity on the part of Rebecca. In April 2018, 2018 Rebecca attended a one-day driving course in Monterey County, California, where she was offered uh, what is referred to as the intense high-speed, high-adrenaline experience, which featured six di distinct levels that would provide thrill-seekers the chance to push themselves to the limit. However, it was very strongly stressed that this type of driving was for the course only and not legal on public streets, as it would be extremely dangerous. Oy vey. If there ever is an oy vey, that is an oy vey. Uh, you can go to a racetrack, though, up north of Los Angeles and get your, get your speed fix and ride around <laughs> in a race car or take your motorcycle and ride around the track going 200 miles an hour. It is quite fun. Uh, all right, Mover Nation, what do you guys think of Rebecca Grossman? Look, uh, it's not about what I think. It's about what do you guys think, my audience. What do you guys, uh, what are you guys sort of uh, thinking about this case? Did the jury get it right? Does this woman, uh, does this woman deserve to be locked up for ultimately the rest of her life? And, uh, or should she have showed some contrition and maybe the court would have been more lenient with her. I mean, we'll see when her sentencing comes up on June the 10th, 2024. So two and a half months from now ish, give or take, uh, we'll find out. Uh, if you, again, if mover nation, if you are a channel member or a Patreon supporter in one hour and Five minutes from now, we will be screening my film, A Murder in Mansfield, a documentary I made with two-time Oscar winner Barbara Koppel. It is uh, premiering on Collier's AV Club, which we have launched this month uh, ahead of April, where we are going to uh, our good friends over at Chat GPT wrote us a wonderful description for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> about the AV Club journey begins. Welcome to Collier's AV Club, where every month we dive into a, the war, into a world of cinematic wonders. From riveting documentaries to captivating movies, get ready to embark on a journey through the lens of storytelling. Join us as we explore, discuss, and unravel the magic of the silver screen, one film at a time. Get your popcorn ready, because the show is about to begin one hour and four minutes from now, three minutes from now, uh, mover nation. I want to say thank you all so much to everyone who, who, uh, came out and participated. If you wouldn't mind, please click that like button. It helps with the algorithm subscribe. If you, if you feel the need, um, 
and you know tune in for more videos like this uh big month coming up big month coming up april we're doing a whole revamp of this channel and my content and the podcast and i greatly appreciate all of you guys um all of you guys uh you know just joining in and again to my channel supporters my patreon members my channel members here your financial support is what makes this is what makes this show possible and i i thank you so much uh on that note mover nation we get through another one i will hopefully see many of you here very soon uh as we get to screen my film a murder in mansfield on that note i'm Collier your landry i'll see you in the next one This podcast is made possible by support from listeners just like you. For exclusive content around this podcast, please consider supporting me via Patreon by going to collierlandry.com forward slash support. Please subscribe via Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts from, and please leave us a five-star review. If you want to see video episodes of this podcast, please check out my YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash collierlandry. You can find links to additional resources in the show notes of today's episode. This podcast is a production of Don't Touch My Radio. Copyright, Collier Landry.